Hey folks, uh, continuing the reading today from the McIlvaney Intelligence Advisor. Uh, we're going on to part two. The American Plunge to a Police State. Ten Steps to Fascism. Uh, this article is written by Naomi Wolf, a widely respected liberal author who does understand issues of freedom versus slavery. Emphasis is ours. In 2006, there was a military coup in Thailand. The leaders of the coup took a number of steps, rather systematically, as if they had a shopping list. In a sense, they did. Within a matter of days, democracy had been closed down. The coup leaders declared martial law, sent armed soldiers into residential areas, took over radio and TV stations, issued restrictions on the press, tightened some limits on travel, and took certain activists into custody. They were not figuring these things out as they went along. If you look at history, you can see that there is essentially a blueprint for turning an open society into a dictatorship. That blueprint has been used again and again in more or less bloody, more or less terrifying ways, but it is always effective. It is very difficult and arduous to create and sustain a democracy. Excuse me. But history shows that closing down Closing one down is much simpler. You simply have to be willing to take the ten steps. As difficult as this is to contemplate, it is clear, if you are willing to look, that each of these ten steps has already been initiated today in the United States by, Bush and, by the Bush and Obama administrations. Because Americans like me were born in freedom, we have a hard time even considering that it is possible for us to become as unfree domestically as many other nations. Because we no longer learn much about our rights or our system of government, the task of being aware of the Constitution has been outsourced from citizens ownership to being the domain of professionals such as lawyers and professors. We scarcely recognize the checks and balances that the founders put in place even as they are being systematically dismantled. Because we don't learn much about European history, the setting up of a Department of Homeland Security Remember who else was keen on the word homeland? Didn't raise the alarm bells it might have. It is my argument that, beneath our very noses, recent presidents are using time-tested tactics to close down an open society. It is time for us to be willing to think the unthinkable. As author and political journalist Joe Connison has put it, it can happen here, and we are further along than we realize. Connison eloquently warned of the danger of American authoritarianism. I am arguing that we need also to look at the lessons of European and other kinds of fascism to understand the potential seriousness of the events we see unfolding in the U.S. 1. Invoke a terrifying internal and external enemy. After we were hit on September 11, 2001, we were in a state of national shock. Less than six weeks later, on October 26, 2001, the USA Patriot Act was passed by Congress that had, li that had by a Congress that had little chance to debate it. Many said that they scarcely had time to read it. We were told we were now on a war footing and we were in a global war against a global caliphate intending to wipe out civilizations. There have been other times of crisis in which the US accepted limits on civil liberties, such as during the Civil War, when Lincoln declared martial law, and the Second World War, when thousands of Japanese American citizens were interned. But this uh, situation, as is, is, uh, Bruce Fine of the American Freedom Agenda notes, is unprecedented. All our other wars had an end point, so the pendulum was able to swing back towards freedom. This war is defined as open-ended in time and without national boundaries in space. The globe itself is the battlefield. This time, Fine says, there will be no defined end. Creating a terrifying threat, hydra-like, secretive, evil, is an old trick. It can, like Hitler's invocation of a communist threat to the nation's security, be based on actual events. One Wisconsin academic has faced calls for his dismissal because he noted, among other things, that the alleged communist arson, uh, the Reichstag, uh, Reichstag fire of February 1933, was swiftly followed in Nazi Germany by passage of the Enabling Act, 
which replace constitutional law with an open-ended state of emergency, or the terrifying threat can be based, like the National Socialist evocation of the global conspiracy of world Jewry on myth. It is not that global Islamist terrorism is not a severe danger. Of course it is. I am arguing, rather, that the language used to convey the nature of the threat is different in a country such as Spain, which has also suffered violent terrorist attack, than it is in America. Spanish citizens know they face a grave security threat. What we as American citizens believe is that we are potentially threatened with the end of civilization as we know it. Of course, this makes us more willing to accept restrictions on our freedoms. Part 2. Create a gulag. Secret prison system. Once you have everybody scared, the next step is to create a prison system outside the rule of law. As Bush put it, he wanted the American Detention Center at Guantanamo Bay to be situated in legal outer space, where torture takes place. At first, the people who are sent there are seen by citizens as outsiders, troublemakers, spies, enemies of the people, or criminals. Initially, citizens tend to support the secret prison system. It makes them feel safer and they do not identify with the prisoners. But soon enough, civil society leaders, opposition members, labor activists, clergy, and journalists are arrested and sent there as well. This process took place in fascist shifts or anti-democracy crackdowns ranging from Italy and Germany in the 1920s and 30s to the Latin American coups of the 1970s and beyond. It is standard practice for closing down any an open society or crushing a pro-democracy uprising. With its jails in Iraq and Afghanistan, and of course Gitmo uh, in Cuba, where detainees are abused and kept indefinitely without trial and without access to the due process of the law, America certainly has its gulag now. Bush and his allies in Congress established a policy that they would issue no information about the secret CIA black site prisons throughout the world, which are used to incarcerate people who have been seized off the street. Despite promising to change this policy and close the Gitmo facility, Obama has done neither. Gulags in history tend to metacize, becoming even larger and more secretive, ever more deadly and formalized. We know from first-hand accounts, photographs, videos, and government documents that people innocent and guilty have been tortured in the U.S.-run prisons we are aware of and those we can't investigate adequately. But Americans still assume this system and de detainee abuses involve only scary brown people with whom they don't generally identify. It was brave of the conservative pundit uh, William Sapphire uh, to quote the anti-Nazi pastor Martin Neumoller, uh who had been seized as a political prisoner. First they came for the Jews. Most Americans don't understand yet that the destruction of the rule of law at Gitmo set a dangerous precedent for them too. By the way, the establishment of military tribunals that deny prisoners due process tends to come early on in a fascist shift. Mussolini and Stalin set up such tribunals. On April 24, 1934, the Nazis too set up the People's Court, which also bypassed the judicial system. Prisoners were held indefinitely, often in isolation, and tortured, without being charged with offenses, and were subjected to show trials. Eventually, the special courts became a parallel system that put pressure on the regular courts to abandon the rule of law in favor of Nazi ideology when making decisions. Develop a thug case. When leaders who seek what I call a fascist shift want to close down an open society, they send paramilitary groups of scary young men out to terrorize system. The black shirts roam the Italian countryside beating up communists. The brown sh shirts stage violent rallies throughout Germany. This paramilitary force is especially important in a democracy. You need citizens to fear thug violence, so you need thugs who are free from po prosecution. The years following 9-11 have proved a bonanza for America's security contractors, 
with the Bush administration outsourcing areas of work that traditionally fell to the US military. In the process, contracts worth hundreds of millions of dollars have been issued for security work by mercenaries at home and abroad. In Iraq, some of these contra uh, contract operatives have been accused of involvement in torturing prisoners, harassing journalists, and firing on Iraqi yeah, civilians. Under Order 17, issued to regulate contractors in Iraq by one-time U.S. Administrator in Baghdad, Paul Bremer, these contractors are immune from prosecution. Yes, but that is in Iraq, you could argue. However, after Hurricane Katrina, the Department of Homeland Security hired and deployed hundreds of armed private security guards in New Orleans. The investigative journalist uh, Jeremy Scahill uh, interviewed one unnamed guard who reported having fired on unarmed civilians in the city. It was a natural disaster that underlay the episode, but the Bush and now the Obama administration's endless war on terror means ongoing latitude for what are in effect privately contracted armies to take on crisis and emergency management at home in the U in U.S. cities. Thugs in America, groups of angry young Republican men dressed in identical shirts and trousers, menacing poll workers, counting the votes in Florida in 2000. If you are reading history, you can imagine that there can be a, a need for public order on the next election day. Say there are protests or a threat on the day of election. History would not rule out the presence of a private security firm at a polling station to restore public order. Editors note, consider the SWAT team who broke into Jose Guerna's home in Tucson and murdered the ex-Marine with his wife and child hiding in the closet. Who would not even let the EMT medics try to minister to the mortally wounded young father? And the U.S. Supreme Court has just legalized this kind of behavior on a national basis. Part 4. Set up an internal surveillance system. In Mussolini's Italy, in Nazi Germany, in Communist East Germany, in Communist China, in every closed society, secret police spy on ordinary people and encourage neighbors to spy on neighbors. The Stasi needed to keep only a minority of East Germans under surveillance to convince the majority of that they themselves were being watched. In 2005 and 2006, when James Risen and Eric Lichtbau wrote in the New York Times about a secret state program to wiretap citizens' phones, read their emails, and follow international financial transactions, it became clear to ordinary Americans that they too could be under state scrutiny. In closed societies, this surveillance is cast as being about national security the true function to keep citizens docile and inhibit their activism and dissent. Reread uh, section one on growing surveillance and destruction and private leaks uh, of privacy exploding on the scene in America today. Go back and listen to it. Five, harass citizens groups. The fifth thing you do is related to step four. You infiltrate and harass citizens groups. The government did this with the militia groups in the 1990s. It can be trivial. A church in Pasadena, whose minister preached that Jesus was in favor of peace, found, himself, found itself being investigated by the IRS, while churches that got voters out to vote, which is equally illegal under U.S. tax law, have been left alone. Other harassment is more serious. The American Civil Liberties Union reports that thousands of ordinary American anti-war, environmental, and other groups have been infiltrated by agents. A secret Pentagon database includes more than four thousand, or yeah, more than four dozen peaceful anti-war meetings, rallies, or marches by American citizens in its category of 1,500 suspicious incidents. The, the equally secret counterintelligence field activity agency of the Department of Defense has been gathering information about domestic organizations engaged in peaceful political activities. CIFA is supposed to track potential terrorist threats 
as it watches ordinary U.S. citizen activists. A little noticed new law has redefined activism such as animal rights protests as terrorism. So the definition of terrorists slowly expands to include the opposition. Editors note, during the Clinton administration, Attorney General Janet Reno labeled pro-life demonstrators, including priests, nuns, and conscientious evangelicals marching and praying in front of abortion clinics as terrorists. And now Obama has continued this trend, labeling Tea Party activists as terrorists. We'll call it quits for this part. We'll pick up with uh, part six and uh, six through ten and the conclusion uh, on our next turret. Meantime, peace.